to Seth Green. Thank you, Seth. It is now my honor to pass the mic to Seth Green for an introduction to today's speaker and our event. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, and thank you for all of your leadership of the Writer's Studio. And uh, welcome all. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Jason Pfeiffer. Uh, Jason, I should acknowledge, is a childhood friend. Uh, so he is someone who I've known for nearly all of my life and who I've respected uh, across that time, except when we were teens occasionally. <laughs> Uh, he is the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine and a host of the podcast Problem Solvers, which is about entrepreneurs solving unexpected problems in their business. Outside of Entrepreneur, and this will definitely ground our discussion today, he is the author of a book just out that Michelle Pfeiffer just tweeted about this morning, Build for Tomorrow, which is an action plan for embracing change and adapting fast. He is also the host of the same podcast name, Build for Tomorrow, uh, and he writes a newsletter, and I'll put it in the chat shortly for those of you who are interested in getting on it about how to find opportunity in change. It's an excellent newsletter. I'll acknowledge, I think I was put on originally uh, without even signing up, but I would have signed up for it, and so highly encourage you to do so, and we'll make sure to get it in the chat. Uh, so, Jason, welcome. Uh, we are excited to have a conversation with you today about the art of storytelling. Well, thanks. Welcome. I'm so happy to be here. I mean, I'd be happy to be here with you all uh, anyway, because it's a great institution and this is going to be a great conversation. But certainly, of course, even more excited because Seth, you and I have known each other for such a long time, uh, all the way back to when Seth had a like life size cardboard uh, stand up of Magic Johnson in his bedroom. Uh, that's how far back we go. Yes, that is how far back, and that does show that I was a big LA Laker fan uh, when I was a kid. Uh, so you just finished a book, Build for yes. Tomorrow, that is full of insight on how we best navigate and thrive amidst change. Uh, and you could have written this simply as a management book, right? Uh, you could have written this with, you know, here are the five very specific things you do, and here's how to do them. And it could have read uh, very much, uh, for example, as an academic. Uh, journal piece, uh, but you made this book truly sing to your readers with stories, stories of famous celebrities, stories of everyday people. And over the course of our conversation, what I want to do is I want to use that book that you've just finished kind of as a gateway into your approach and tips on storytelling. And so to set the table for the rest of our conversation, I think it's useful to kind of introduce the book in short form. And so can you provide kind of the two-minute snapshot of the book, and then we're going to jump into how you wrote it. Sure. Sounds great. Okay. So the book, you know, it's funny, just before we started, uh, I, I feel like I should hold it up as a visual. Um, so I, I will also then share, share with you a little tip that I figured out for social media. So here's the book. You see it do you see it backwards or do you see it forwards? We see it backwards. See it backwards uh, but we right. assume that's just an optical illusion. That you As you should. No, no, no. As you should. Because this is a fake cover of the book that I had printed backwards. And the reason for that uh -huh. is because I post it uh, because Instagram Live is a great place to promote a book, but they show a mirrored version of whatever you have. So I printed out a backwards copy of my book so I could hold it up on Instagram Live. So here is the um, here's the actual cover that I ripped off and replaced. Um, so uh, and and I've sold a lot of copies of books on Instagram Live. So just for whatever it's worth, future authors. Um, so Build for Tomorrow comes out of this insight that I had, which was that if you listen to the questions that people ask you, you will realize that people are really telling you what they think your value is to them. And when I became editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine and I started getting interviewed at, uh, on podcasts or at events or whatever, people would always ask me the same question, which was, what are the qualities of a successful entrepreneur or what are the qualities of a successful person? And, and I realized the reason they're asking me that question was because they saw me as a pattern matcher. I have access to all these people, and therefore I should be able to match patterns among all their experiences. And I thought, well, I should have the answer to that question because if you know what your value is to people, then the more that you know how to fulfill that, the more valuable you're going to be. And I realized as I was going that number one, the answer to the question was they're adaptable. That's the that that is the thing that that successful people have in common. But two, that this was a thing that really went far beyond Seth. To your point, this is a thing that went far beyond just work uh, and far beyond management. This was really a thing about people's lives. And you know, as I was thinking about how do I reach the most number of people possible, I wanted to make sure that I was speaking 
in a way in which I was creating as many on ramps as possible, because ultimately, you know, the thing is that you can you can tell someone something hyper specific and it can fit into a hyper specific place in their lives. But if you can understand the deeper place in which you can be a value to people and find something that they all have in common, I think that you can just reach a much larger audience. And I wanted to engage really as big an audience as possible and in an, as emotional as in as an emotional way as possible. And so that's why I did the book the way I did. Well, so I want to now go into the kind of process of writing yeah. from spotting the story to researching it, to writing it. And then after I ask some of those questions and we kind of put the different ideas on the table, we're gonna to come to your questions in the audience. So please begin preparing them. And so let's start with how did you spot this story, so to speak, in terms of, you know, obviously as an editor, <laughs> you're regularly deciding what is and isn't an appropriate story. And so tell us both about your tips on how to spot good stories and then mm -hmm. give us this maybe as a tangible example of how you came to the story within Build for Tomorrow. Yeah, so I, I like to tell stories at different levels and I'm always thinking about what level I'm at and, and how, to, how to make sure that I'm, I'm doing something that is as big as possible, but also can drill down and, and, and hit people uh, uh, in a really tangible, personal way. Um, so before I tell you about the book, let me just tell you about this philosophy that I have about, about storytelling in general for me. And now I realize that the thing that I'm doing is, is a little hyper-specific. And just for context, what that is, is that I've entered this space that I, I mean, I can't believe I'm going to use these words because I used to find them so obnoxious, but I've entered the thought leader space, right? Where, where what, I, what I am now is I, I represent to people um, an, an authority in a particular space and they, they treat me like an authority. And so I want to, I want to serve that because frankly, it's an opportunity, but I also want to be really respectful of it and, and, and do it right. So I had realized that one of the most effective means of storytelling in this space was what I, what I've come to think of as, um, I mean, in speaking, I think about them as interlocking parts, which is to say these these kind of these kind of these chunks of of ideas and story that I can stitch together in whatever means are going to be most useful at the time, depending on the audience that I'm talking to or the way that I'm writing. But anyway, the the components of them are really three parts. So there's number one, there's a big idea with a name. Incredibly important to have a name for your ideas because that gives it a, a, a sense of uniqueness, and it also kind of cr creates a little boundary for it, right? Like you're, you know, you have an idea, and it's inside of this particular framework. So a big idea with a name, and then a story of someone else who has figured out this big idea or has experienced this big idea, and then a story of me trying to figure it out myself. So that's a that's a unit of story that I often think about. When I write my magazine column, I often do it in that unit. When I speak on stage, I'm often doing it in kind of units of that. And I knew that when I wanted to do a book, I wanted to do a version of that, but I, but it, it did it couldn't it couldn't just be a bunch of those over and over again because that's not a book. That's a series of anecdotes. So I needed an overarching story. I needed one big narrative that that everything that I was talking about could fit into. And it needed to be big, but it needed to be flexible and it needed to be able to be something that could be filled out with lots of big ideas that collect together into one whole. So for me, that story became this. Throughout the pandemic, I realized that everyone is experiencing change in four phases, panic, adaptation, new normal, and wouldn't go back. This was just a story that I started telling on sales calls and uh, that, that I would, when I, when I was talking to entrepreneurs and it was resonating. And I like to work my material out in the real world before I even write it down. Sometimes I'll have an idea and I'll kind of tell it to somebody in the form of, I think I figured this thing out and I see how they react to it because if they see, if they're experiencing it as, as, as truth, then I know I'm onto something. And if they push back and they say, mm, I don't know about that because maybe it's really more like, that's valuable too, because now I'm gonna see what people are thinking when I share this idea and I can refine it to get it to the point where it's really gonna ring true. So once I had that framework, then I started to figure out how could I take all of my stories and insights and big ideas with names and arrange them in a way that felt linear and progressive so that I was ultimately paying off on this big idea about how to get from panic to wouldn't go back. Well, so you now have this idea and yeah. this example, 
And you want to now research and develop these stories that lead into this big framework. And so I'm curious kind of how you approach that research stage of the project. Uh, and I saw, obviously, reading your book that you have global celebrities like Dwayne The Rock Johnson and mm -hmm. Maria Sharapova and, and others. Um, but, but tell us a little bit about kind of the thesis that is kind of guiding the, the research in this. And then how do you decide on who to go after for stories? And, and then what stories stick? I imagine yeah. that you got a lot more stories <laughs> than the ones that you actually pulled together in the actual book. And so, yeah, tell us about the research phase and how you approach it and what your tips are generally for people that are trying to write ripping nonfiction. Yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, I there's a lot to say there. So I'll, I, I'll, I'll fill in as much as I can and then you'll have to remind me where I started from. Um, so one of the things that I always think about whenever I'm writing is that I am, even though I'm going to be writing about somebody else, I'm gonna write about somebody figuring something out or somebody's journey that I'm really writing about the reader. I, I'm always mindful of that, that the thing I need to do is make sure that the story that I'm telling and the way that I'm telling it is ultimately not really about the person that I'm writing about, but it is really about the person who's reading it. And, and what does that mean? That means that, that when I write a story about let me take it small and then I'll grow. So I write a lot of celebrity profiles for, for Entrepreneur Magazine. We have a celebrity on the cover and I always, and I, I don't always, but I do a lot of them myself because I enjoy them. It's fun. So um, I know that the reader of Entrepreneur Magazine doesn't have a lot in common with Jimmy Kimmel, right? Just not, not a ton in common with Jimmy Kimmel. They don't have the same career path as Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Kimmel, of course, the um, host of The Tonight Show. Um, they, um, they're probably not in entertainment or comedy. So if I'm gonna sit down with Jimmy Kimmel, I don't wanna just write a story about Jimmy Kimmel because frankly, that's not gonna be useful to the people who are reading. The store question that I have to ask is, how does sitting down with Jimmy Kimmel benefit my reader? And so what I try to do is identify something in Jimmy's own personal experience that he's figured out that is very relatable to other people. And so, for example, with Jimmy, uh, you know, I, I went to his office in, in 30 Rock and spent an hour and a half with him and, and um, got really personal talking about his own kind of figuring out who he was and how he recovered from major missteps in his career and ultimately came to this story that was really about how to figure out your purpose and meaning to others. How do you, how do you understand what you are to other people and then how do you serve that and he you know he came this he came he came to this really interesting insight while while I was talking which was that he realized that the, the driving force behind everything he does is this simple question which is can it make people happy and that, that's wonderful that's so relatable to other people because everyone has their own version of that in their own work and so now it's my job to take Jimmy's story and then build it out in a way in which anybody can kind of see how to create that same insight in themselves. So I do a lot of what I like to call bricks and mortar. Um, this is just my own way of thinking about writing. So if you were to, if you were to read through my work, what you'll see is, is a kind of constant going back and forth between bricks and mortar. So to me, the brick is a, is a, is a fact. It's Jimmy Kimmel said this, or this is something that happened in Jimmy's life. And then right afterwards, I will take over as the, as the narrator in this story. I will take over and I will add some context. And I'll say, you know, Jim, Jimmy, Jimmy will be quoted saying, um, saying uh, you know, that, that the reason he tried to be a movie star was because that's just the path. That's what, those are the lines he used, right? He, he came out of Saturday Night Live and that's just the path. And now I take the story back and I say, that's just the path. You want to hear, you know, like four words that end in, uh, in, in, end in failure. That's just the path because it's not your path. It's someone else's path for some other purpose, right? I'm taking it over and then I'm going to come back to Jimmy. So the bricks are the facts. The mortar is me making sure that it's connecting to the audience. So I'm always mindful of that. So when you, when you ask about the research, um, oftentimes what I do is I don't go out really knowing exactly what I'm going to get but rather knowing that if I put myself in environments where I'm talking to really interesting people and pushing them towards the things that I know are gonna be really useful to my audience, 
I can gather the most material possible and then basically step back and say, what do I have? What are my assets? And then how can I put these together in a coherent narrative? Um, I, I, I try not to paint by numbers where I where I set out with a with an idea of what I want to fill in, because I don't think that your idea of what you're going to get is going to align with the reality of what people are going to tell you. So I instead like to flip it and say, here's the general idea of what I'm hoping to get out of this person, but they're going to tell me something that I hadn't considered before. And then that is really going to drive the next phase of, of this. So sometimes in a chapter that I was working on, I would, I'd, I'd be, I'd be in the middle of a chapter and I'd say, you know, I, I have a, I have a good idea here and I don't exactly know where it needs to go next. And I would just get somebody on the phone. Like I, like I got Jim, um, um, Jim McKelvey, the co-founder of Square on the phone when I was stuck in the middle of a, uh, of a chapter. And I just told him the theory that I was working on. And I said, what do you think of this? And his response was brilliant. And he just had these interesting ideas. And I thought that's, that's the next part of this chapter. So I really, I like to let the, let the, the material guide me rather than the other way around. Well, so let's now come to the place where you have the material and you have this kind of set of ideas about how you want to deploy it. And oh, so now- so, uh, Sorry, sorry, Seth, I'm just going to interrupt because I'm looking at the yeah. comments. Yes, Jimmy Fallon. Nobody tell Jimmy Fallon that I, I, that I confused him with Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Fallon, I met with Jimmy Fallon, not Jimmy Kimmel. Thank you, please continue. Well, and, you know, we can just say it's hard when you've got two late night hosts with the first yeah. name Jimmy, right? So uh, a fair, a fair right. mistake. Yeah, but fault. thank you to our awesome, uh, you know, audience to, uh, to fact check during this. And so uh, a very good journalistic practice. Uh, yes. Uh, well, so, and, and a good opportunity to see that even uh, when you're in Jason's shoes, you can still occasionally uh, yeah. you know, Mess up misremember your names. Yeah. Uh, well, so uh, coming to the writing now, so yeah. got your idea, got your research, have these stories, now you've got to organize it all. And you've got to think about how do you put it into a book, and to your point, that's very different than, you know, the opening letter or a specific commentary or mm -hmm. article. Uh, talk about the process for writing this book and kind of bring us through the whole of it, how you kind of thought about, organize the chapter and structure then the habits you might have used to actually allow yourself to then write this. And, um, and I know you are very uh, disciplined. So I think, you know, as I uh, read your blog, you know, it's something that you really practice in terms of a very, you know, um, formulaic approach to how you're going to get from, from here to there. Yeah. So, yeah, let me do that in reverse. So the execution, um, first of all, um, I like to, I, I think that people should identify how they work best and then build a structure around that rather than trying to impose a structure upon themselves. So, um, so what, I, uh, what I have recognized in myself is that I am sharpest in the morning. Uh, it's, it's when I write the fastest, it's when I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of quickest with association because a lot of my writing I think is, is, is built upon my ability to have seen or heard something and then relate it to something else that I saw or heard at another time, because then I can build these larger connections. And, you know, as the day goes on, I become slower at, at, at that. So I structure my days in which writing happens in the morning. Uh, I never schedule meetings before noon. And, uh, and instead I carve that time out. Now I knew I had to write this book it, with with a lot of other demands on my time because I I, I edit Entrepreneur Magazine I have I do a whole lot of other things, so um, I don't I, I I knew that just I couldn't just set aside I couldn't take a month of book leave and write a book it wasn't going to work because frankly I only got an hour or two of good writing in me per day anyway so um, so instead what I did was or rather I should say I have a, an hour or two of good writing per project I find that after about an hour I can switch to a different project and feel a little more refreshed but staying in one project I, I run out so um, which again is just that's me you know and it's good to know and so um so what i did was i said you know instead of trying to do this as one big project which is never going to work why don't i instead just come up with a system that's going to that's going to maximize me right be, be be most efficient based on my abilities and resources and then um, get me to the finish line and so i decided i will devote the first hour to two hours of every day to this book for nine months that, that was going to be the book. 
And that's what I did. So I, I just, I never missed it. Sometimes if I was on a roll, I'd give myself a little more time and I'd push the next thing out. But I felt really good about that because it allowed me to create a cadence where I would be working on one chapter and then I'd work on one section within that chapter for that day. And I knew that when I reached the end of that, my brain has kind of made a complete loop. I've gotten to one place where I feel like I can close it off and now it's time to put it away and I'll come back tomorrow and I'll be refreshed. I just don't think that it makes sense to push yourself. So that's, that's how I do that. And, um, and then the structure of the book, you know, it's funny when I sold the book, I sold it. I proposed that I do it in these two sections where the first section of the book, the first half of the book will be about why people fear change. And then the second half of the book will be how to overcome that. And I started writing and I realized that didn't work. And, uh, and I wrote the first couple chapters and I sent it to my editor and, and he also just agreed it didn't work. And, um, and part of the reason was he said, you know, you're not building towards something right now. You're, you're kind of just throwing anecdotes out. It feels like a series of magazine articles that are disconnected. And I realized I needed to create a structure in the book that felt linear, right? That felt like it was moving from one place to the next because I don't have a traditional linear narrative, right? If I was doing a nonfiction book in which I followed somebody for a year or two, there would be a there would be a, a kind of natural narrative arc. But with big ideas, there often isn't because they don't drive, they don't work that way. So instead, I thought, let me come up with something that has that narrative. Now I've been telling that story about change in four phases, panic adaptation, new normal wouldn't go back for a while. I didn't think of it as a structure for the book until I looked at essentialism, which is a, a, a best-selling book. And I saw that that author had structured his book in four sections as well, and each one built onto the next. It was almost step one, step two, step three, step four. So I stepped back and I thought, what would happen if I just used my story as the organizing principle of the book? And then I realized that all my ideas suddenly snapped into place and they, they, they created a narrative arc. And that's how I ultimately structured it. Well, so we've had a chance to dig into your authorship of this book as a way to look at storytelling. You are also editor-in-chief of a major magazine, Entrepreneur, uh, and I want to just hear when you're the editor now and you're making decisions about what is going to go into the magazine, tell us, you know, as you think about storytelling from a pitch perspective, you know, what makes a successful pitch of a story and how have you made those decisions with the other hat of, you know, discerning what to put in? Yeah, great. So when, when people pitch me, the thing that I'm looking for is, does it pay off on this, this belief that I have that each story actually has to be about the reader? Which is to say that if you're going to tell me a story, most people, when they pitch me stories for entrepreneur, they pitch me a a story of a company that's that was successful, right? And they tell me that this company did this and it led to this, and now they're selling billions of dollars of widgets or whatever. And you know, the problem is that that's not a useful story to anybody because success stories aren't really all that useful. Problem stuff, problem solving stories are what's useful. And so what I'm looking for is somebody who has gotten down enough into the story, has talked to the people enough that they have this insight into a decision that somebody made, into the way that somebody thought through a problem. And by understanding what that person did, a reader can say, oh, that is a really smart way to, to, to do something. I'll give you just the quickest of examples, because um, I know we also want to get to questions um, from people in the audience. But the quickest of examples is, um, you know, there's this woman uh, a, a couple of years ago who pitched me um, her own. She's not a writer. She's an entrepreneur looking for coverage, but it, it applies. She pitched me the story about um, her company that makes a butter dish. Now, uh, here's a fun fact. You don't need to refrigerate your butter because it can stay outside and then it's nice and easily spreadable. The problem though, if you don't refrigerate your butter is that if you have a butter dish, right? Like you pick it up, it's gonna bump into the butter. It's gonna get really messy. So she had created a butter dish on a hinge, which never bumps into the butter. It is clever. And so she was looking for coverage of that. And you know, we're not butter dish monthly. So it wasn't really a story for us, but then uh, she told me in this email that she reached out to about this thing that she had done where she said, you know, she was trying to get, she was trying to do some consumer research, some market research on this thing to understand what kind of colors people wanted and what the price point was that they were willing to pay for this. And she went to a company and said, what does it cost? And they said $10,000 and she didn't have $10,000. So she's trying to figure out what to do. 
And then she's sitting in a uh, airport at some point, uh, about to board a plane to somewhere. She's looking around and she realizes that this airport is full of people who have absolutely nothing better to do than answer questions about butter dishes, right? Like they have nothing better to do. They're just sitting there. And in fact, you could have started at gate one. And by the time you got to gate eight, everyone is new at gate one. You could just do it over and over again. And in fact, if you have a ticket to fly out, nobody cares when you show up. So you could have a 5 p.m. flight and show up at seven in the morning. You could do this all day. And so this is what she starts to do. Every time she's flying somewhere, she shows up early and she just starts like surveying people, acting like a surveyor, not like as the founder. And um, that's how she gets her work done uh, and market research done. And the company has been quite successful. It's called Buttery. And um, uh, at B-U-T-T-E-R-I-E. And, uh, and anyway, um, I love that story because it's not a story about a butter dish. It's a story about resourcefulness, right? And when you, when you see someone think like that, you start to think about how you can take a totally different approach to your own work. And when I see those kinds of stories, basically what happens is I start repeating them over and over and I see which ones people react to. And then the ones that people react to, I use even more. And then I start to circle them or cycle them through everything that I do. So they'll show up in a newsletter and then they'll show up in a podcast and then they'll show up in the magazine and then they'll show up in the book and then they'll show up and be, be talking. So I'm, I'm kind of using myself as a filter for, for what's sticky, but I'm always being mindful of what is it that is going to be ultimately useful and insightful for the person? So your question was about pitches. And the answer is that I'm always looking for someone who has picked up on that core DNA of the thing that we're doing. And if they've nailed that, then I know that we've got something for us. Awesome. Well, in the chat so far, we've got a number of positive comments about your book, as well as someone who is waiting for it to be available in India. Uh, but you know, come to a question yeah. from uh, Veronica Cuevas, uh, who says, who is your top interview subject on your bucket list? And maybe we can just add further to that for kind of learning why are they your favorite you know, uh, person and, and what do you think you can learn from them? So I don't, I, I appreciate the question. I don't have a interview bucket list at all. And the reason for that is because the most memorable interviews that I've ever done were people who I had never heard of. And that includes very famous people. So, um, uh, you know, for example, not long ago, um, if anybody is a Walking Dead fan, if you watch The Walking Dead, uh, what the like, star of The Walking Dead is Norman Reedus. I Don't tell Norman. I had never heard uh, Norman Reedus. I never heard his name. I don't watch The Walking Dead. But we signed him on for, for the cover because a lot of people love him. And I decided to do the do the interview myself and I loved him and he had so much insight. And, um, and, and I just, I just realized over the years that the greatest stuff is often going to come from people that I couldn't have anticipated. So, uh, so I, I stopped, but, and also conversely, sometimes you'll be really excited to talk to somebody. I've talked to CEOs and athletes who I've, who I, whose work I have followed and then they weren't that insightful. And so, um, so I'm not really that interested in, in bucket lists. Uh, I, I really would rather try to just understand what is driving an individual person to make the decisions that they are. And when you, when you just approach people, like I want to open your brain and see how it works, you find just magical things. Well, so on that note, uh, we have a very relevant question here from Laura. You mentioned you like to tell other people's stories in addition to your own for most effective storytelling. What do you think of the limitations of telling stories just about ourselves as a memoir, for example? And maybe you can just kind of compare and contrast because you've seen, I'm sure, a lot of memoirs. You also are in the world of writing other people's stories. You know, how do you think about that? And I'm curious, you know, how you've approached it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I should have said when I when I gave that that little structure, big idea with a name, story of somebody else, story of me. The story of me has a particular purpose, uh, and that purpose is that I get to stand in for the reader. So when um, I mean, I'll, I'll just give you a, a, an example. I won't go through the whole thing. You can you can you can read it in the book. But uh, but there's a there's a thing called uh, one of my ideas with a name is called work your next job. And uh, so work your next job is this framework that I have for how uh, like the most important things that you can do or the things that nobody's asking you to do, but that happen to be available to you. And, um, and whenever I tell that story, I, I, I tell it by with the idea and then this framework and then somebody else and then me. And the reason I use me is not because I'm that interesting. The reason I use me is because I 
can control my own story and therefore tell it in a way in which I can stand in for the reader. So what does it mean to work your next job? Well, let me tell you how I did it. And then I can share with you the anxieties that I had as I went along the way. And so that's what I want to do. Now, when, when I think about memoirs, I've read a lot of memoirs. And, um, and the ones that I have always been attracted to are the ones that tell a story in a way in which, yes, you are following that person in their journey, but ultimately what they're doing is capturing something that is deeper and relatable. You know, I think about, this isn't really serious memoir, but um, David Sedaris, if you, know, if you remember, you know, me, me Talk Funny One Day or whatever, you know, he has a whole ton of great books. Um, uh, he's, he's very, very funny. He tells these wonderful, poignant stories. Um, but the reason why they work is because they're not just TikToks of a funny thing that happened, um, not in the capital T TikToks, but, the, but, you know, but rather what they're really doing is that each story is an engagement with a feeling or an idea or some truth about life that, that other people can relate to. And so you find yourself in those stories. And that is, I think, ultimately what we should be doing when we're telling our own story, because we want to think about it this way. Um, you know, there are there are, this is what I find with entrepreneurs is that entrepreneurs often miss the most important start part of their own story when they tell it. Um, the, you know, the, the, every story is a three part story, right? It's a hero's journey. We, well, step one, we set out to do something. Step two, there was a setback. Step three, I overcame. Um, now the problem is that most people in business, they, they take out step two. They want to just tell the story of I set out to do something uh, and it was a success. Um, but, um, but the problem is that that's a boring story and it also doesn't, it doesn't create any kind of on-ramp for people to connect with you because it's the setback and it's the experience and it's the trying. That's the thing that actually everybody can relate to. So when we're mindful of what parts of our journey are the things that other people could come along with us for, I think we really connect ourselves to the audience and we give them the space to join us on the journey. Candace asks, when you tell stories of others, how do you ensure the authenticity of their experience is captured without inserting your own implicit bias? And I'm Assuming that that may be, you know, from the experience of your identity and different lived experience than the people you might be writing about. How do you approach that? And, you know, how do you try to bring that into your work, both in Build for Tomorrow and in Entrepreneur? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I, I think, uh, sorry for the siren, if you can hear that. It's Brooklyn, so there's a siren every three minutes. Um, I, so, look, you make a great point. There's, there's, Obviously, if if a story is if someone else's story is being told through me, then there is there just simply is going to be part of me in that story. It's 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 sort of not possible for there not to be. And so what I try to do is make sure in my own work that um, I am recognizable, not like, hey, look, it's me. Now it's Jason's turn in the story. But right. But rather that it's pretty clear what facts are the persons and then where the, the story simply has a, a perspective and you don't, you don't get confused about, about whether or not this perspective is coming from that person or if it's separate or if it, it's, it's complementary. Um, I, I really, I lean into it. And the reason for that is because I feel like my job as a storyteller is to ultimately get the material to connect with someone, right? My job is not to be a ghost writer and simply tell someone else's story. My job is to make sure that people's experiences are meaningful to my audience. I always think I am here to serve my audience more than anything else. Um, so when I'm interviewing somebody, I wanna make sure I really, really understand them. And I have a lot of techniques to do that. Just one for really quickly is, um, um, I, when I'm interviewing people, I, uh, first, I always start by telling them the purpose of this interview. So when I sit down, whether it's with Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy Kimmel, um, I will, um, I will, uh, I will always start by, by saying this is what I did, um, with Jimmy and with everybody else, you know, I'll, I'll start by saying, um, you know, here's what I'd like to do. Uh, you know, you have had a, uh, you know, you have an amazing career in life and, um, and the, our readers are not going to follow your path uh, because you occupy a rare space, but you have figured something out. You have figured some human thing out and, um, and it helps drive you and, and orient you in your work. And, and I want to understand what that is because I want us together to, to, to teach basically the readers about what that is. And, um, 
you know, they'll say, oh, that's great. That's great. Now they don't really understand what it is that I'm going to do, but I've now oriented them. So they understand when I'm going to start like drilling into these kind of process questions. And, um, and, um, and then as I go, so here's the thing that I do. I, I don't just ask them questions. I pose theories. This is, I found this to be the, just the single most valuable interviewing technique. Uh, which I didn't come up with myself. I stole it from Ira Glass, the creator of This American Life, who I saw speak when I was in college. And, um, and he said this, and I, I just, I didn't really even understand what he was talking about at the time, but I, I since made use of it. So he said, he said that, look, um, uh, when you ask people questions, they, they, are, they are often going to, um, they're going to give you their sort of surface level answers. And especially if you're talking to people who have been interviewed, if you're talking to people who have been interviewed a lot, they're going to have heard every question before. Uh, and so they're going to have stock answers for it. If you talk to people who have never really been interviewed, they're going to be very nervous and they're not always going to know how to answer your questions. Um, and so when you, so you engage them in a conversation. And by the way, I never go in with a list of questions ever. I go in with a couple ideas of starter points and then, and then I see where the conversation goes. Um, um, I listen to them, I react. I never have a list of questions because if you have a list of questions, you will anchor yourself to the list of questions and you'll never actually listen and respond. So, um, um, so I listen and I, we have an interesting conversation and I start to try to piece together, maybe 15, 20 minutes in, I start to try to piece together things that they said. You know, it's interesting, Jimmy, you, you know, you just told me about this decision that you made. And, and, and I wonder if the reason that you did this was actually because you had had this experience 10 years before where it shaped this other way of thinking. And, and do you think that that drove the thing that you just did? Now, it doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong about that. Like, this is the beautiful thing about the theory. I, the theory could be wrong. Um, and, and sometimes, by the way, I literally will preface it with, I have a theory. I'll be like, Jimmy, I have, I have a theory. Um, and, um, and the, but the, the reason to do it is because it forces people, number one, it shows people that you're listening at a very deep level and they really react to that. But then number two, it forces them to think in front of you, right? Whether the theory is correct or incorrect, it forces them to think in front of you because now you're taking different parts of their own experience and putting them together in a way that they hadn't thought about before. And they don't have a stock answer for it. They just have to pause and think. And that's when you get the best material. So, um, so I do a lot of that. And as I'm as they're talking, I'm also starting to think about the story that I'm going to write and the the perspective that I'm going to bring to that story. And I start to run it by them in real time. I'm kind of writing the story, and then I'm throwing it at them, and I'm seeing how they engage with it. So that by the time I'm done, I feel like I know how to write the story in a way that is going to feel truthful to them, but without confusing my own perspective with theirs. Well, so we have another question here that you partly answered, but I want to come yeah. to it anyway. It's about your daily habits in terms of practicing this craft and also what things may get in the way. And you've talked a little bit about time management, mm -hmm. but talk more broadly about kind of habits of writing and about what maybe has gotten in your way over time and how you overcame it. Let's uh, make sure you're relatable to our audience and, uh, <laughs> and the problems that you encounter. Yeah. Um Okay, so number one, I, I, I've learned long ago, I still make this mistake, but I, I, um, I try not to, as you know, like I told you, I, I know when I'm good at writing, um, but sometimes I still have to produce something at a different hour. And, um, and I, I find that uh, I can push myself through, right? I can write something at 11 p.m. if I need to. I'll look in the morning and it will be bad. Like, you know, it's just, it's like, why did I even bother doing this? So, so, um, so I, I, I do, I try to reel myself in um, on those. Uh, you know, the habits that I've really built are, are mostly around understanding structure of writing uh, more than anything else. Because look, I, I don't think, I don't think of writing as like a creative art. I mean, I, you know, you can think of it that way, but I think of it as bricklaying. Um, I really do like, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, once you know how to lay the bricks, you know how to build the wall. And then really what matters is that you just spend the time doing it and doing it well. Um, and the same thing is true for me in writing a, 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 an art, a magazine article or a podcast or whatever, which is to say, I go out and I gather the material. I spend time with sources. I do a bunch of research and then I have a, just, I have a bunch of stuff around and now my job is to assemble that stuff. 
And that requires a lot of brain work and it requires kind of finding these connections. But I think of it like bricklaying. I take this story here and then I put this thing over here. That's why I said bricks and mortar before. It's, it's just how, so, um, so number one, I've trained myself as a habit to simply think about it in terms of process and then to respect when I'm best at that process. And then to be really, really mindful of all the different ways in which something can be built. Um, I am, um, when I read, for pleasure, which I don't really have the time to do that much anymore, uh, or I listen to podcasts or whatever. Um, you know what I'm doing? I'm primarily paying attention to how things are structured. Oh, it was really interesting that they started here and then they went there and then they brought that guy back. Why did they do that? Oh, because it really made that point. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm kind of building a menu in my head of ways to build things. So that when Liz is a contributing editor at Entrepreneur and she's been working on this story for months and we, we had a call two weeks ago about how to do this thing and she's struggling with it. And I said, you know what? Go find this New York Magazine article from two years ago because the structure of it is exactly what you should do here, right? It, it, once you start to see architecture in things, you start to realize that the architecture is repeatable. And then once you know the architecture, then you're just able to build the thing. That's what I do. Well, this has been a spectacular conversation. We are at time, Jason, but I wanna share a huge thank you. It's been a lot of fun for me to catch up with an old friend, but also even more wonderful to share your brilliance with our audience. Um, I will acknowledge that I've just put into the chat um, a specific course where if you've been following this conversation and are interested in going further, uh, there's one class in particular that I think might really relate to the content we've discussed. It's about how to turn ideas and nonfiction into gripping narrative. And it's written by, it's taught rather by the author of Seinfeldia, and a number of other New York Times bestsellers. So I just wanted to share that for those who want to continue your journey. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, final word, Jason, uh, this is your first book. You've written a yes. lot in other spaces. Um, what's the most rewarding? Give us the 30 second, uh, you know, why is yeah. this different than all other things and uh, even better in terms of the reward? So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Seth. This is so fun. Um, I am very self-promotionally just going to drop the link to Amazon for the book. Uh, there it is. I would love if you picked it up. Uh, that's in the chat now. And as you know, I'm not really good at 30 second answers, which is why it was good you said that. So now I've wasted 20 of them. I will say that the, the most rewarding part about this honestly has been the Putting out a book is very, very hard and it, you can't do it alone. It requires a lot of support from the people that you know and the people that you don't know that well and then to total strangers who just um, join in the, join in the, 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 the fight with you. And um, that's different from anything else I've ever done. And, um, and it, it forced me to ask for favors, which I'm deeply uncomfortable doing. Um, it forced me to put myself out in a promotional way, which I don't generally do. And I got to tell you that the, the response to it has been unbelievably gratifying. I mean, so much so that like, like, Paul, like you said, um, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer, this, I like, this didn't happen by accident, guys. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer just posted a photo of herself, if you can see with the book, Michelle Pfeiffer. Why? Because I got to know her and she liked the interviews. And then I asked, I asked and she did it. Um, and I, I'm, that is uncomfortable to me, but it's unbelievably gratifying to see when people people show up for you. And that's really cool. Well, it's a great story because here we are relating to you and uh, maybe a little bit of insecurity. And then you got the confidence to ask and look what happened. So uh, we'll, we'll end on that story. Thank you all and have great afternoons. And thanks again, Jason, for joining us virtually. Thank you Bye, all. Everyone. This is fun.